You. Thanks, Aaron. Hello there. Welcome to Book Club, it is me. I hope you can hear me. How is everyone going today? This bloody book. Alrighty, Gideon the Ninth. We are doing a part two where it, we're going all in for Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. Uh, thank you so much to Fandom as we kick things off for doing a little sneaky raid as we start the stream. Gotta love that when one door closes, another opens. Thank you to the team of Fandom. If you haven't gone and clicked Fandom or twitch.tv slash Fandom and given them a like, 
and a little follow and a hey, how's your father? Maybe don't ask that. But you know what I mean? Just pop over and say g'day, g'day. Um, let's get that happening. Oh, Phantom says, you're welcome, Maud. Getting in there right at the start. The timing was beautiful. Hey, Jericho. Lovely uh, to see you. Thank you for the follow. Appreciate you. Every Wednesday, not every Wednesday. Well, every Wednesday we do a book club. The first two Wednesdays of the month, Geek Bomb does one where we tackle a book. The first Wednesday is the first half of the book. The second Wednesday, which is this Wednesday, we finish the book and we talk about oh, the book. <laughs> Ah, if you know, you know. I can't say the book normally anymore. Uh, ever again, I've been cursed by a blooper. Uh, what's happening? What update are we doing? Alexa, we good? We good? My technology is just having a hissy fit. Uh, book good. Thank you. The uh, and the. T Anyway, thanks for joining Book Club. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank you, M the Cartographer, for the um, resub seven in a row, 12 total, which means you've been hanging on this ride for a year now. Love that. Yeah, Kate says, Alexa good? <laughs> Alexa is not good. Alexa is going to disrupt this stream. How is my chat going today? I swear. I told you you were going to disrupt, and what do you do? You get chatty at me. I want to say a big shout out to GameWizard001, who subscribed for their 21st month. That's insane. I get to thank you personally. Thank you, Aaron. Hey, Aaron, do you remember 21 months ago when I was convinced your name was Steven? <laughs> convinced. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's why I changed in Discord to have Aaron next to Game Wizard Zero Zero One, so you wouldn't forget. Yeah, and I don't think I have it since, but wow. Which now started the trend with other people in the in the Discord to like put their name next to their username. And I am forever grateful every single day for it. Uh, thank you to Terry, little weird guy, all the way from Melbourne, who subscribed at tier three for eleven months. Thank you so much for all your ongoing support. Little Weird Guy is now a moderator as well in here. Lots and lots of fun. Lisa's in the comments saying, how are we doing tonight? KP Dubs is like, we're doing. <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> I feel that. I did just have a little bit of white chocolate before, though. <gasps> we all know how much I love my white chocolate. So that's where I'm at. Catch-22 is here, but working the late shift again. Play the boards here saying, I'm great. How are you? Play the board. What's your name? Watch me forget it. Or call you something else. That's my forte. Um, Lisa says, my allergies have gone crazy. Oh, Rudolph knows. What a way to humble someone. Those stinking allergies. And allergies in this economy, really hard to have them because everyone just immediately says COVID. But Lisa's like, hold my beer. Already just had it. <laughs> Already had it. Um, BC Knight was like, yeah, read, read, read. Love that. Saying, hi, Maud. And I say, hi, BC Knight. Um... Oh, KP Dub says this week it's Boo Club. Hold the K, but keep the scares. A uh, high toaster poster. Hi, Can Rugger. Book good. Uh, that is uh, Alexa. Wake up. <laughs> good one, Jimmy. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. Ah, oh, Da Vinci says I got to get it right because I've got my version and my version's wrong. Says hello. There it is. Not hello. It's hello. Cool. Thierry says, I've been sick since last Friday and according to two rapid tests, it's not COVID, but I've been coughing my lungs out since Saturday morning. Oh, no. Kate says, I mean, Stephen says, everyone is Stephen now. Stephen. That's my favorite meme of Tuna Melts My Heart. Tuna is the dog with the really severe overbite. Um, and it's like a Starbucks order. It's Stephen with a PH. <laughs> And so they say, Stephen, <laughs> P-H-T-E-V-E-N. That's my humor. Play the boards called Manda. Love that. Hi, Manda. Hello, Manda. Or oh, AKA Steve. Lisa too is here. Uh, Ember and Aaliyah, a big hello to you. How are you? 
I love that Ember and Aaliyah is just like, sign me up for any book club I love to read. Oddballs had a long day at work. Working hard for the money. Play the board says, hey. Hey. Uh, BC Knight says to Thierry, get well soon. That's sweet. Alrighty, Gideon the Ninth, we finished it. Book good. Yeah, we've got a Triforce of Manders. That's kind of cool. Um, Michelle says, I'm happy to be at book club. Life has been a roller coaster the last couple of weeks. Oh, preach. Oh, I should have gotten a drink. I've been drinking a lot lately. I got to not drink. I had one too many last night when I was at an after party at Dave and Buster's having the time. It was like midnight like that. Oh, so good. I played Dance Dance Revolution. I played a Tomb Raider shoot game, which was fantastic. Reload. Boom, boom, boom. Cash she says, congrats on your movie premiere, but yeah, it was totally my movie. I'm in this film for six seconds. And I was like so nervous about appearing on the big screen that when I did my first line of dialogue, I looked to my friend Michelle and I said, I need subtitles. I can't understand what I said. <laughs> Kenzie says, very good evening. Even though this isn't the sort of story that interests me, I loved the characters and the world. Oh, Kenzie, I want to know why this isn't the kind of story that interests you as well. That's even good feedback. The giant Pac-Man game looked pretty awesome. Yeah, except the, the, um, it, the joystick was not sensitive. It was, you had to, it was a bit delayed. It was not, it was like a six out of 10, 60%. Oh, I can't work with those conditions. I need accuracy. Uh, book good, out of five. Let's go. Gone from bottom to top. And if you want to know what that means, there's a list of people in the Discord. If you sign up to Patreon and you sign up for the $5 tier, you get access to the rest of the Discord. Like there's a locked down section. And one of the channels in there is hashtag reading where we talk about books 24 seven, where we take votes and polls on the next books that we're gonna read and cover, where we just share general inter interest and recommend books that we've liked uh, and where people can participate in these two Geek Bomb book chats. Uh, you also get sneaky access to the after show for the last episode of Nerdist's Book Club. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's not broadcast anywhere. You got to be there or you got to be circular. Uh, the numbers are coming in thick and fast. Uh, I'm going to start at the bottom of the list of people that are in here, which means the bottom is V for Vaden. What'd you give this one out of five? Was book good? Yeah, book good. Book At least good. for me. I, I had some issues early on with it, especially with the the way they spoke. But like by the end, I was pretty happy with it. Like the writing got I don't know if the writing got better necessarily, but like it started really, making more sense. Yeah, it made a lot more sense, especially after the first chat. That helped a lot to actually understand what what, that, what that was actually going on because I was super confused. Mm. But yeah, overall, like I was happy with it. Like the world, the plot, like the theme, except in the chat was really good. Like they like everything was centered around the necromancy and the way they, you know, the, the words they use to describe things. Like they, they, there's a lot of like medical terminology they use about like talking to talk about like specific bones, like specific, you know, bones. Molars. And, like, yeah. Molars and yeah. like crepuscular stuff like that. It's like a, like metacarpals, all those sorts of stuff like that. So I, I enjoyed all that stuff. Okay. All right. Would you give it out of five? Uh, 3.5 out of five. 3.5 out of five. Book good. Book not great. Okay. And you like the second half of the book better than the first. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> God damn it, KP Dubs. <laughs> I found the bone talk quite humorous. <laughs> Jimmy, out of five, what'd you give Gideon the Ninth overall book good? I I gave it a four out of five. Uh-huh. Um, I enjoyed the book a lot. In the second half, like I was saying in the ch book chat, I actually felt like I wanted to face paint after a lot reading this book. Great. Because I thought it was really cool. I also briefly read some of the book in a graveyard because I figured why not? That is applying for extra credit. Uh, and so credit where credit due. You went to a graveyard. That is some le next level immersion, says Vaden. Absolutely. How was that? Um, well, I, I'm a little, I'm a bit su superstition, superstitious. 
Yeah. So I was like, I'm not going to take any pictures or anything. But then I took one picture. And I was um, like, this remember. Um, it wasn't at nighttime. It was during the day. I'm not, I'm not going to do it at nighttime. Yeah, I would freak out. Yeah. literally just took a spot that wasn't a grave, mm -hmm. sat by a tree. And, and resurrected some skeletons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, on my laptop, of course, not the actual book. Because I don't have the physical book. Got it. Got it. But it was it was an enjoyable time. Um glad to hear it. Four out of five right there. Oddball. Book good? I saw you give it a four out of five. What'd you like? Yeah, uh, it got a lot better after the first act, I thought. God damn it, KP Dubs. I'm so sorry. KP Dobbs says, whoa, in a graveyard, sounds a little harrowing. <laughs> Sorry, go on, Vol. No, it's good. Um, I had to switch over to the uh, audiobook. The, uh, the, the actual text was about, uh, it was an issue for me with just a bunch of errors in it. What do you so mean? <gasps> uh, it was just uh, like grammar and spelling and words together. Really? In, in my version, yeah. And you were like, uh uh. So you went to audiobook. How did you find that? Uh, the audiobook was way better for me. Okay. A couple of us last week said that we really struggled with the audiobook. I'm glad it worked for you. I'm glad it really amplified the experience. What'd you like about the book? Well, once it started to pick up, uh, the flow was a lot better, and you got a sense of the the actual characters. Yep, I agree. I got some gripes on that, but I agree. Once you get to know them, K. Frida says, "Look, the audiobook was not for me." But then Kenzie says, "This audiobook rocked. The narrator was fantastic." This is the thing about art. One person can love it, one person can loathe it, but it's the exact same thing, but experienced and received in completely contrasting ways. I think that's really fascinating. I didn't love the narrator. I kept tuning out, but it's not to say that the performance wasn't bad. They have different different voices I've heard a lot worse it's uh I compared it to Liza Block Lamora where it was a very boisterous um narrator and for some reason the boisterousness doesn't kind of like sink in for me but four out of five is great but K oh yeah go I think I also it was good for me because I did it on like 1.25 speed this bitch is on 1.6. Ah. Gideon grab, grabs the claymore and all of a sudden was like, what do you mean, Harrow? Well, I'm just trying to do my best job. And then Harrow was like, oh, come on, Gideon, you are absolutely a sodding piece of shit. That was what I was listening to. Yeah. How was my um, impression of it? Not good. Thank you. Impression good? <laughs> Good. Great. Kate gave it a five out of five. The best you can give it. Kate, why'd you love it? It's everything I love in a book. Everything I love in a book. So we are doing lesbian necromancers in space. Your username is Miss Necromancer. As far as necromantic plot lines go, what did you like about this dissection of necromancy? Well, I said it last week. I like that they didn't go for the just the stereotypical kind of necromancer. It was all kinds of different aspects and uses and really expanding that it's not just because the ninth house is like the very kind of what you think of, like the D&D &D very atypical, not atypical, sorry, like the um, archetypal sort of necromancer. And I loved there was more to it than that. There was like a thought into that it would permeate all aspects of life. And I mean, I love the characters. I love, like, I mean, I love the fusion of sci-fi fantasy, all that kind of stuff. I mean, fusion genres are my favorite genre of music. So I like that when books do it too. So mm -hmm. 
I just, it's everything that I love in a book. I will say this is the first time that necromancy has been explored where it hasn't been tainted and, you know, a disgusting use and abuse of magic. Uh, I did like that they were like, we're all necromancers. We just happen to be different types of necromancy, but it's a staple of survival. Um, and that, yeah, there's different ways that you can kind of learn and deconstruct and reconstruct living or dead organism. So I did think that, that was interesting. Do I understand it? Do I, did I get what was ha happening? Do I know each house's uniqueness in terms of their necromancy? Did I struggle with learning anything? And I will get into why. M the cartographer. Book good? Book good. Four out of five. Four out of five. I really enjoyed it. Yep. Um, I like living in a goth punk world for a while. I, um, the, they're like reading it felt like reading sort of like retro fantasy comics and short stories and stuff. Just like there is a lot of that no explanation um, about the vernacular that's used and stuff like that, which I, I kind of like. It lets me, I find that my imagination goes wild when I read books like that. So um, I, uh, yeah, I thought it was really fun. I thought it was fun. I think it, we've not ever read anything like this before. And that's really, mm -hmm. really cool. And that's super refreshing because I remember talking to Trisha about playing a lot of fantasy games and why I skipped dialogue. And I'm like, because I could almost predict what the themes and tropes are because I've read them all before. But this one, yeah, super, super unique. I really had to pay attention even though I couldn't. Toast supposed to says, I love that the book doesn't get bogged down with uh, where the necromancy comes from. It's just there. It's just a part of their world. Bones. Lisa, three and a half out of five. You and I struggled with this. Did the second half of the book get better for you? Yeah, well, I did end up going back and rereading the first half. Good on you. Um, I read along with listening to it and I slowed down the audiobook, so that helped. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I liked it overall. Um, didn't love it. I think I, I just didn't really connect with the characters and the first half was pretty slow for me, but uh, I, I ended up enjoying it. I think I'll continue, I'll continue reading the series, but it's, probably not going to be one of my favorites <laughs> it's sitting in the back of my mind what kate said last week which was if if you what was it kate you said like if i didn't like this then i was gonna hate the next book <laughs> no i said if you struggled with trying to understand this book the next book would melt your brain good this that book is it's like reading hooked on phonics compared to reading like existential philosophy you are going to struggle. Okay, I haven't known a moment where I haven't been struggling <laughs> with this book. <laughs> like, if this was the tutorial. <laughs> oh, no. Dragon's Ghost says this. The next, the next book is like, if, like, comparing like, a Minions movie to Eraserhead. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Do I want to give two weeks of my life trying to find that out? <laughs> Kenzie says, yes, let's go. <laughs> I have the book. I bought it. I bought the book. I was so confident. I have very, very rarely gone into a book club really having about 60% grasp on the premise. I don't like that. Usually I will read it. Uh, I will go over it again a second time and then pick up all the things that I missed. I didn't want to do that for this. I didn't really have time to do it for this. I had a week. I had a week. Um, regards, Jaren says, I'm excited to reread the next one. Miss Necromancer says, I will say, though, that Harrow the Ninth is fucking weird, but the payoff is spectacular. Well, I mean, she's balancing 200 personalities, right? Okay, Frito says, attention span crisis part two. 
<laughs> no for me. <laughs> okay, Frida, that's a great way to say that's exactly what I suffered through. Attention span crisis. It was nothing short of a crisis. Uh, Aaron says, and here is where I was saying, let's read the next one. And now I'm not so sure with that description. <laughs> That's what I'm assuming your lol was. It was a panicked lol. <laughs> Lisa says, yeah, I've heard so many people raving about this series. So I really thought I'd love it. <sighs> yep. KP Dubs, how'd you go with this? What'd you think? I think I saw you say four out of five, but good. Yeah, yeah, four out of five, but good overall. I like the story. Um, I like um uh, the descriptive imagery like the battles the rooms the laboratories all that kind of stuff i liked how um the necromancy was almost like glorified they, they they'd say the room was like beautifully moldy instead of just like you know gross and moldy uh, yeah like, like that. it was um, celebrating the dank and dark yeah yeah and I'm, I'm sure we'll probably get into a lot of this stuff later but you know they were Trying to discover all these tests and they were talking about theorems so i'm wondering how much of science in the histor history of this world how much science plays into how necromancy came to be the thing that everybody does also they're at their empire is at war with something somewhere so maybe necromancy is not viewed so universally great everywhere so anyways i have a lot of questions i want to keep reading the series um, but boy, it was hard to keep track of all the characters, especially for the first half. So that's why it wasn't a five, but I liked it overall. Okay. I like that. I mean, I'm actually on the same page, pun as you, with a bunch of the mm -hmm. um, non-criticisms. Um, so I hear you on that. I have been looking into it and I wanted to kind of gauge the internet scope on it because you're right. People love it. People like it and people loathe it. And I really wanted to get into the heads of the people uh, from all three angles of that. Uh, and some of the gripes that people have eloquently spoken about, I probably reflect accurately with the most. Aaron, book good, book, book good. Sitting on the fence about the series as a whole now. Uh, book good. I gave it a three and a half out of five. Mm-hmm only because of things that were kind of touched on where it's like way too many characters and by the time you start like an idea of like who's who somebody's dead <laughs> yeah it, it i don't know if you ever heard of the game uh Engen Rumpa. it's a murder mystery game where it's like a bunch of kids trapped in a school and the only way to get out is somebody has to die and you have to get away with it there's like 16 characters it's so like over time obviously the character list shrinks and it felt kind of like this where it's like yes you have so many characters you have no idea who's who they have similar sounding names too so it's even harder to keep track and then somebody dies and it's like oh, wait who was that they were here with us uh, okay i guess they were and now they're not yeah yeah there was a lot of character bloat um and oh. with very i mean jimmy makes such a great point and i hear you completely on that if we didn't break it down like we did last book club, I would not have liked it as much. Completely agree. If we didn't stop at the halfway point and look back and analyze and dissect um, and truly kind of explain like that, this visual art, what was the? I didn't have that no. luxury because I this one through it like I did fiery. <laughs> this was a game changer for me to be able to visualize all of them. And that's where my first gripe comes from. Uh, KP Dubs, I'm so glad that you said they were like sort of celebrating uh, instead of it being sort of eerie and gross and creepy. They relish in that sort of creepiness. Um, I missed a lot of the descriptive language. I found often that, and I really wanted to learn why for the majority of books, I can picture everything. I'm immersed. I'm there. And for this one, it wouldn't stick. What was happening with this writing where I couldn't grasp and I started really, really paying attention to how it was written and there was such little description for me, not enough or done in a way that didn't provide enough clarity of how they were engaging and interacting with their surroundings, what 
mannerisms or nuances or kind of like physical engagement that they had with each other. Um, and I think that they kind of leaned so heavily into the dialogue to be able to explain through dialogue all of those things instead of the supporting writing in it. And there were so many times that they would go to describe something and then it would just 180. And I'm just like in a sentence or two, I'm like, how did we get from here to here? Hey, Tibonsk. Um, Play the board says that everything was portrayed through really colorful similes. And maybe that's why it was really kind of hard. There wasn't enough sort of like cement or foundation to build upon. It was just sort of like a Jackson Pollock of flourishing sort of similes. Um, Aaron says you would want exposition versus narration. And I agree with that too. There you go. Uh, well, I wish I kept up so I could see that I'm trying to, uh, cause trying to picture all the characters beyond Harrow and Gideon was really hard. Yes. Um, so I think that that was one reason with her writing in particular, where it was way more sort of like character POV and not enough situational for me to get that, if that makes sense. Um, I also agree with the part where the book starts 40% in. The book gains traction and starts taking shape 40% into the book. The problem is in that first 40%, we did not get character development outside of Gideon and Harrow and we did not get world building. So how are we spending nearly the first half of the book establishing when there was really nothing to establish? That to me is why I'm giving this a three out of five. There are more good than bad, but there is not enough for me to give it more than, than a three. Um, and I think that there's a couple of things going into that, the narration for me, the lack of description for me to be able to place the characters in the environment and see how they engaged within that environment. This felt a little bit like a play. It was just dialogue on dialogue on dialogue on narration on dialogue. Um, and within that dialogue, there was, no, yeah, right. There was just not enough clarity. I don't know how else to say it. Um, because we're trying to establish sort of space and the exposition of these houses and the different types of necromancy and the fact that a necromancer and a uh, cavalier are paired, why this is happening, the distinguishable differences between all the houses, the, the, the differences between their personalities, the difference between their use of magic. There is a lot to understand. And the second half was way more enjoyable than the first half because of that. Once we had established enough, once we all got together to actually describe and discuss who the truck these people all are, I needed all the help I could get. And I think as someone that does a lot of reading, it is really hard for me to sit here and tell everyone how much help I needed with this. It makes me feel bad. Um, and I love that other people took to it like a duck to water and that it was so easy and wonderful and descriptive and, uh, accessible. I just didn't, I didn't have that. And I think that this author does want to mess with foundations. I mean, she's created this Gothic sort of castle palace mansion space station, uh, she's blending genres. She, Tams and Muir, who I'm talking about, she, the author, she is really kind of challenging the norm. And I think I just need slightly more norm is all. Uh, Aaron says the downside with Gideon is that she's the outsider. So she isn't included in a lot of the nuances of the magic going on. And yet all the Cavaliers to one degree or another is far more knowledgeable. Harrow needed her at first for keeping up pretense, but then not any real function. So because of that, she doesn't know all that much. And so she, like us, the reader, can be a little lost. At least I was. 
Yes, yes, yes. And even Cara, Lin uh, Cara Link's cosplay. Hello, Cara Link's cosplay. First time chatter here. Love that you're a part of book chat. Says, I agree with Game Wizard 001. I think Gideon being lost was intentional to make the reader feel a little lost too. Um, so, okay, some of us have sort of like that as a reader feeling a little overwhelmed or lost or non too, like not too sure of what's going on, not having steady footing. Um, so I think for me, it's like, if you're going to keep me in the dark about some things, then overcompensate in the others, just so I've got a little bit more of a grasp and a steadfast hold on it all. KP Dub says, yes, Muir creates so many questions. I mean, space travel technology, but then only swords, no guns, let alone lasers, etc." KP Dubs just gifted a sub to Coralink's cosplay. Thank you so much, KP Dubs, for making Coralink feel super, super welcome in this community. Kate says, I like the way I felt off footed, worshipped at the altar of chaos. Kate, you and I bond over chaos. We're chaos queens. I would usually love this shit. Why do you think that this was really, really working for you and not at all working for me? roast me I don't care what's wrong with me I think it might be the fusion aspect because last week you said like is it sci-fi is it fantasy you know that it was kind of messing with your ability my, to my default setting imagine yeah yeah it was too that you're you don't live in the fusion you need it to be separated that's kind of true, isn't it? Because I would have this really, really accurate depiction of what I thought was going on. And it was a dungeon with lots of wood and thick metal handles and archaic and swords and cavaliers. And then they would say something like the airlock. And I'd be like, well, because you like me and Rachel and we've all talked about the Fantasia, Aphantasia stuff before that you say it's like I can picture it immediately but you're maybe drawing from things you've seen from pop culture where everything has very divided like when you think fantasy you think like Tolkien western fantasy when you think sci-fi you think like Star Trek or whatever right so when they're mixed up you can't separate the pop culture and let your brain go a little soupy so but, maybe that's where it is but I think that like when she'll mention something, if I'm not given enough direction to set, dress the set, so to speak, if I'm not given enough attention to detail, um, because if someone were to say to me, like, right now, there is an elephant, it's purple, it's wearing a, tu a, a tutu, it's spinning on uh, an aeroplane, which is dangling from a carrot. I'm like, yeah, I got it. None of that makes sense. But also maybe it's a little like with the aphantasia thing where a little bit of almost like a dream, you know, where things in a dream aren't concrete. And it might be a little like smeary, like someone put like a Vaseline filter or took their hand through a painting yes. and smeared everything. Yes. So when you're pick trying to picture it too much, you can't smear it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Because instead of like you know, me going da 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 and there's an airlock and I go, all right, adjust. I go, what? Ow, ow. Um, I, and then I'm like, the last chapter doesn't make sense to me anymore because I haven't done the right thing with my brain. Hmm. Uh, Toasty Post says, yes, Gideon was the POV character and Harrow was the protag character. Hmm. Vaden says, even chaos needs a foundation, okay, the world building, to break or subvert. Without that, it's just confusing. Alrighty, so great discussion point. Who here thinks that there was a solid foundation and who here thinks that the foundation was made of quicksand? Lisa, I'm going to throw to you for that. Oh, you just commented saying, I have aphantasia and I don't picture anything, so I just don't even really pay attention to this description that closely. Lisa, do you, th do you feel like there was a strong, solid foundation or was it a bit oh, worth it uh no i mean i felt like there wasn't enough any any kind of world building or character building for me um which is why i didn't really connect to it very well right. um so I, yeah I, de I definitely feel like it was a uh, quicksand <laughs> yeah yeah kp dubs how's the foundation 
Yeah, there was a lot of amb ambiguity there because you're like, okay, why are these different houses not more allied? You know, they're all supposed to be servants of the emperor, and yet they're all butting heads right from the beginning. They're all secretive. So I would just like to know why that is. Um, and we don't really understand. Like I said, there's apparently a military, there's an emperor, there's all this stuff, but who are they fighting? What's the whole politics behind it all? Why uh, should yeah, I care? Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of questions. Um, it wasn't enough to really pull me out of it too much, but I, I can definitely see how it would for other people. Uh, Kate actually says it really well. Uh, it was dreamlike. The foundation was smoke. What a great way to say it. Uh, Oddball says the, wor the world was not really there. It was more people to people. Yeah, and I think I really struggled with that. Um, Tyson Poster says was, uh, there was a social foundation. There you go. But I think for me to be able to kind of like keep in the story, I need to place the characters in the scene, so to speak. That sounds like Hector. Ooh. Also, Thierry totally calling me out in the Discord. I saw that you posted it, posted it. But when I was just, and I think it actually goes to Kate's point really well, where she goes, you keep drawing from pop culture and that's your, like the, the view, the frame of it. So it all has to fit within that frame. The example that I gave was literally 80% from Fantasia. <laughs> he just posted the picture of it with a hippopotamus in a tutu. Uh, so there you go. I Even when trying to make something up incredibly random, I have do I dove into a pop culture memory. Hmm. Fascinating. Kate says, funnily enough, I sometimes get bored with world building. When we were reading all those high fantasy books together, I was getting so burned out by the world building. And it got to the point where I was like, I just don't fucking care anymore. Just let the characters talk to each other. Touche. But I mean, when I was reading it, I'm like, I understand it completely. Now discuss. Yeah. So fascinating how our brains work. Oh, what was the... What was the hippopotamus from? What was that from? Dumbo, maybe? No. Uh, Aaron says, every time they tried to establish the world, they jumped to something unrelated, which makes you forget the world building and made it irrelevant. Great example that I have for you. This is spoilers right at the end. Gideon makes a very desperate attempt to take down this high lictor by thrusting and um, impaling herself on these spikes. So that's the end of the chapter. She kills herself. The next page, Gideon's starting to talk. And I'm like, did I miss something? She's definitely... And then I kind of found out that she's talking through her psyche. But like that sort of jump, that incoherency, I need to be spoon fed Instead, I feel like, you remember Glory in Buffy, how she inserts her fingers into the brain? That's what it was for me. Kate says, I have powerful retail brain. It's not that I don't understand the world building, uh, but I just do not care. <laughs> don't tell me the backstory about why you're returning this book. I promise you, I don't give a shit about your problems. <laughs> Okay, I'm so glad that this is your book club home. And has been for like, what, are we at six years now, Kate, chatting books together? Six years? Oh, I. it was in Alpha. When yeah. Was the first, I, I, I started that. The first one I joined at was maybe... Which book? Philosopher's Stone. Maybe was the first one. That's twenty. That was easily in twenty. That's twenty seventeen. So that's five years. Okay. That's, that's five yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, KP Dub says, "Oh my god, I feel so seen right now." Powerful retail brain. I've got my PRBs in here. I mean, I thrived in retail and I worked in retail. Hi, how are you? Uh-huh. Yeah, you're going to project all your bullshit onto me, but I'm going to smile and make sure you have a great experience. <laughs> That's why I ate so much chocolate when I worked in retail. <laughs> I, I, used to, I used to buy chocolate bars and discreetly eat them and then discard the wrappers under the racks of clothes and then they'd do a cleanup and they're like, who keeps eating this chocolate? And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know, but 
disgusting if you ask me. Kay says, retail is so hard. Anyone who thinks it's easy has never done it. Vaden says, never worked retail. Pretty sure I would hate it. Vaden, retail is for extroverts. Retail is an extrovert's job, not an extrovert's dream. But you literally have to approach people for a living. Mm, Kate, you have extroverted tendencies, though. You can talk to anyone. You might not want to talk to everyone or anyone at all, but you can really efficiently and effectively communicate and talk in that way. <laughs> uh, Aaron says, retail or any customer service job is harder than it looks. Yeah, you are, you are in a way indirectly giving permission for people to throw their bullshit at you. Yeah, I don't get paid enough for that. No one gets paid enough for that. Um, is that you, Cherry, saying you joined Apple Book Club with Interview of a Vamp for a Vampire? Yeah, I love that the, that I've got OG names from Alpha Book Club when we all sat around in the studio drinking wine, chatting books through um, those shows. I they're some of my favorite memories in my life. Um, M the Cartographer was in that. Game Wizard was in that. Sprinkles, you were there, I'm pretty sure. Mr. Necromancer was absolutely there. We had other, we had a few other sort of like reg, regulars. Is my favorite. What? <sighs> Carboni. Anthony says, no spoilers, but you're going to lose your minds at Gideon the 10th. You tried so, I'll give you that. I will give you that. You came in strong. You've said it with such confidence. What if I told you that the sequel was Harrow the 9th? So it's, you, you just change the name, not the number. Change the name. But execution, 10 out of 10. Commitment, 10 out of 10. Subtlety, 9 out of 10. Wasn't bad, Anthony. Wasn't your best, but it wasn't bad. I'll give you that. Uh, Toaster Post says, I don't want, I don't want, I want, but I want it now. Every customer ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lurking frog says, hello, lurking frog. Lurk. <laughs> oh, we have a little lurk emote here. It's my favorite. It also reveals how old I am if you use it. I really enjoyed both this book and the sequel, mind bending but not breaking. I think treated the story. Uh, I think treated the story as a mystery about revealing the world rather than the world being the foundation for the story. Yeah, that's exactly what I feel like we are dissecting for that one. Um, Coralink says, to be fair, there is a lot more world building in Harrow the Ninth if you are interested in continuing the series. That's what I want to do. How do I do a poll? No one ever told me. Poll? Yes. No. Yes. Poll. T-Bone says, got to chow. I want to open up a poll. I want a poll. I want a poll. Can anyone make a poll? Oh, I'm panicking. Ember and Talith says, I thought Gideon wasn't intended to be a particularly curious or self-reflective character, so we saw most of the world from that point of view. It seemed like a lot of the necromancy was beyond what they could or really wanted to understand, but I expect more of that will come with Harrow. Yeah, really great observation. I get that. I get that completely. Basically, the poll that I want to do, <laughs> the poll that I'm trying to, the poll, I need to make a poll. The poll that I want to do is, I already forgot. I'm so excited about making the poll. What was the poll? Now, I've said poll so many times that poll doesn't even register. It's not a word. Poll. Poll position. Poll. Poll lease. <laughs> uh, there is no poll. You don't want to see a poll. The poll was, are we going to, I think the poll is, do, are we going to read the second book? Who wants to read the second book? Do we skip or do we read? Let me just like embarrass myself in front of everyone. Skip. I, I swear. Hey! Do we read Harrow the Ninth? 
It popped up for me. I did it by myself and you saw it. I was ready to fail publicly, but I'm failing up. All right. Uh, read it. Skip it. Stop, Paul. I did it. No spelling errors. Thank you, everyone. Oh, little weed guy. I just found out how to do it. You just do a forward sl forward sl slash poll and then enter and it pulls it up. Go ahead. So it's anyway, there's a poll up. Do we read it or do we skip it? No, <laughs> I'm voting skip it. Please vote. <laughs> Kate said, I love that in the Australian accent, when I say Terry's user handle, it sounds like I'm saying little weed guy. <laughs> well, your name's green. So that checks out. Kate Frito says, can I vote more than once? No. Absolutely not. If you're listening to this right now and you've got access to the poll, little weed guy, <laughs> I just don't say ours in some words. Um, oh, our minute is up. Fuck it. It was close. It was close. It's weird. Weird. Little weird guy. Weird. 55%, 45%, that was the split. 50, 55% said to read it and 45 said skip it. I'm I'm going through the <clears throat> disc. Aaron, skip it or read it. One minute was not enough. Mm -mm. I say read it. I'm invested enough to say read it, at least give the next one a chance and then go from there. You know, the worst part about this is that everyone just saw me what it looks like when I'm making a sookie face. <laughs> everyone saw it. I went, I went all sookie. Terrible. There's a camera on me. No one needs to, no one needs to see me do that. I'm a grown ass woman. KP Dubs, skip it or read it. Uh, I say read it. I'm probably going to read it either way. So yeah, let's do it. I want to, I mean, the reason why I would do it is to support female kiwi authors i think the the biggest thing is we got like an epilogue of the emperor i want to know who this guy is ah uh, see more about I, that. so i'm i'm ready for that <laughs> i feel like when we did the mistborn series i got a whole lord ruler i got a big big dose of that so that wasn't appealing to me personally but you know mistborn wasn't fucking with necromancy so hmm. lisa skip it or read it honesty I'm okay with skipping it. I'll probably continue the series eventually, but I'm not uh, hard pressed to read it right away. I I want to read the where the crawdads sing. Crawdads, crawdads, crawdads. What are words? Zelda, sweetie, you're snoring so loudly that it sounds like a trombone is playing. Is that getting picked up? She's like hitting a deep bass C note. <laughs> KP Dubs, get out. <laughs> Can you hear that? You can hear that? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's deathly silent. The only noise outside of my breathing. This is such a noisy dog. Sorry. Um, I'm the cartographer. Read it or skip it. I would love to read it with the group because that's preferred method of reading stuff um, is with the group. But I think it's a lot of people saying skip it. Um, that's it. If half of us aren't like, don't want to, that's, that's a lot of people. That's, it's, it's more so, alarming than what we've had. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, could postpone it and see how we feel after some time. I, I agree with Lisa though, as well. If I was going to, I think Lisa said, if I was going to read a tricky book that I don't love, I'd rather do it in the community. 
Yes. Wait, is that yeah, what you that said? Too. Maybe you said no, that? No, I think Lisa said that too, but that's what I was thinking. It's like, I always find that when we're not loving books, we have really good discussions. Yeah. And I really, I really appreciate it. Like I would not have been able to finish. This would be 100% on my DNF pile. 100% I would not have finished this book if we didn't have a halfway point to check in. So I know that's a non-answer, but I don't know. <laughs> it's tough. I just got interrupted by the loudest snoring dog in the world. Um, I did hear that one. You did? Okay. <laughs> It's like a trombone. <laughs> oh my god! Like, is my dog dying, <laughs> or is she joining a band in her sleep? Find out next week. Um, a lurking frog says, "I'm curious what the DNF rate was compared to other books as well." Uh, little weird guy says, "When my rabbit snores, it sounds like a little whistle." <laughs> Worst part is, I look down and she's going. Just a little pause shake. She's, you are in such a deep sleep. I'm yelling and you are so asleep. You are so asleep right now. I'm sorry. I just cannot get over this stuff. When can we get a Zelda cam? I know you need to see this. What if I pick her up? She's going to be so sleepy. Do you want to see like a sleepy, sleepy dog? I owe her nothing. Get over here, you little snozies. <laughs> Did you know that you were snoring so incredibly loudly that whole time? Are you aware of the noises that you make? Would you like to tell the people at home <laughs> how you feel? Respond. Did you just burp? We lit, we caught that on camera, baby. Okay. That is the face of a dog that does not care at all. You made it onto the burp pole, the burp count. How you feel? What were you dreaming about? Were you in the band? You want to go back to bed? <sighs> Just because I love you. You want your treat? Do you want the treat? You want it? We're doing a book club right now and I'm just so... I'm so distracted right now. Is your little tongue poking you? Get it. Wait for it. You know what the magic word is, book chat? Do you know what the magic word is? I'm going to say it. It's not princess. No, it's not tiara. No, it's not hippopotamus. It is okay. Good girl. Okay. Whoop. Oh, sorry, not not the best landing. Push back in your bed. Sorry. Got very distracted. Now you understand why I get distracted easily. Great. Um Yeah. Exactly, Cash 22. Mm-hmm. She's so noisy. I love you. Alrighty. Um, Oddball, would you read this one? Would you Would you want to keep reading? Yeah, I could uh, read it. There's uh, questions that are just left open that I would like to see how they're resolved. Okay. Jimmy? Yeah, your name? Yeah. Um, I would read it, you know, just for the sake of reading it. it you know, I'm in more indifferent like uh you know whatever mm. i'll give it a shot yep kate kate's uh very publicly calling me out for skipping her wasn't an accident totally on purpose <laughs> baden skip it read it i would say skip it just because 
like half people aren't that interested in, in reading it, and um, we have we have a lot of people that we normally do. I think in other books we read, so I feel like there's just a lot of people that just aren't that into it. So, like I'd read it for sure for the for the group, but I don't see myself reading it outside of it. Yeah. Okay. I'm exactly the same. Uh, if I don't read it with this group, I'm not gonna read it at all. Uh, but if people can spend the next half an hour telling me what was really cool about this book, then maybe we could get inspired. Kate, because I missed you with the vote, I already knew what you were going to say. Uh, can you tell me your favorite world building? Do you know what I was going to say? Yeah. You, Do you? You would say, <laughs> we're getting called out. You'd be like, it's so different from the... <clears throat> This book is so different from the first book. It's really going to be great. Harrow's an amazing character. We're really going to find... Am I on the right track at all? Why do you make me sound like a valley girl? That's all I can do. <laughs> the only American accent you know. <laughs> I think when you no, get to... Say... Oh, no, no, no. When you get to a boat page 20. A boot. <laughs> there you go. That's non-valley. Yeah. <laughs> what would I you was say? I say... Mm. You own the company. You don't have to ask us. Just tell us that I, we're not reading the book. I want to do that so bad. And there was a point where I'm like, oh, I don't want to read it. I'm not going to read it. I'm just not, I'm not going to read it. But I like to think, at least give the illusion of a democracy here. <laughs> Fucking hell, Kate. Making me reveal all my deep, dark, evil secrets. Um, yeah, there you go. I like to think that we, you know what? No, well, what we could do if to do a veto, a presidential veto, we could spend the last hour going through the Wikipedia of Harrow's plot and just anyone who wants to read it, bow out. I've already read the book, so I feel like I don't even have an opinion. Oh, uh, I, I mean, I absolutely want to read the blurb of uh, Harrow the Ninth, but I wanted to hear from you specifically. We were talking about the, how the necromancy in this book's really next level. It's really cool. I struggled learning who can do what. Was there a standout um, creative spin on necromancy that appealed to you the most? Well, I mean, I always do like the typical. So, I mean, the Ninth House is still my favorite, but I really liked the way... Um, the sixth house did it where it was very like mathematical and like you know doing it like equation based and i liked the way the third house did it so i liked that every house had a little bit of a different aspect to it right and i even liked that the second house was more like the police you know what i mean so every house had its very different ways that you would if you had this grand power, obviously you would manipulate it to do different things than just what we've seen so far in most fantasy literature. All right, let's talk it. Let's talk it through. Mm. All right. As far as the necromancy goes, Ninth House resurrects skeletons. They can reanimate a skeletal corpse and create a skeleton army. Yeah, that's what Ninth House does. They're classic necromancy. They uh, we saw it in the opening of the book where they had a fight and she basically planted bones in the ground so that she could resurrect the skeletons and that's what Harrow's really good at doing. Silas and Colm, what were their necromantic? I could find this online, but if anyone knows, Eighth House, what was Eighth, eighth House's? Soul sucking, oddball. Tell me about the soul sucking. I don't really remember much. It's just they suck the souls. Siphoning, energy transfer, yeah. says Star Pilot Six. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that, Thierry. Um, all right. So soul siphoning. Um, the seventh house. Well, that's not even Dulcinea. We haven't even gone into the twist with that one. Um, but what could Seventh House do? There's a poem at the beginning of the book. Did we get that in the audio book? Oh, it's ringing a bell now. But when you give me information when I can't make sense of it, it doesn't it doesn't sink in. It's like describing the color red instead of going, it's that color, you know? 
Um, sixth house is very mathematical with it. Fifth house, we didn't really get to learn it, but apparently Dulcinea killed the fifth house because of their particular ability and it was a threat. Yeah. <laughs> Reanimation for the seventh house. Uh, the fourth house... What, were the, what was fourth house's abilities? So this is a thing. Like I should know. I should I should give a shit about it. Like this should be really fun and interesting for me. And I just don't know. What is fourth house? Four for fidelity facing ahead. Regards, Darren says, the fifth necro was a historian who was digging through the old place for info about the lictors. Got it. Seventh house was almost Frankenstein in a way. Yep. The soul flame was the fourth house. Soul flame? When did we have soul flame? Yeah. I think it was right before he died. Oh, I thought that was Polemides who did the, put it up in flames. Seven, sixth house. Soul this flame. This was done when they were looking for the body of the seventh cavalier uh, and this is where the the bone tentacles and that big monster and he yeah. got that was visceral i will say the, the most description i ever get and the thing that i can see the clearest at how all of these people die i'm like yep yeah, cool harrow's face has literally had burst blood vessels under her skin and her face is blood Yup, Isaac was basically levitated out of the ground because he was skewered and pincered by these spiky bone tentacles like a human pincushion. So I know exactly how everyone dies and can see it from every angle because that's when I got the most descriptive language. Uh, house number three, there is a lot of controversy around the third house. Ianthi had basically became a lictor. She thinks she's the shit. She thinks she's so cool. Uh, Corona was a bit of a blubbering mess about the whole thing. I couldn't tell you super why. That was a bit much for my comprehension. Who wants to talk about what happens at the end with house number three where Ianthi killed the Cavalier and Corona is a blubbering mess about it? Does anyone want to break that down for me and explain what happened there? Corona never had powers. She was faking it the whole time. Star Pilot 6, shut your mouth. Is that true? Corona, Corona, Corona Beth never had powers? It was all Ianthi? Why was there a twin? Harrow the Ninth is very much a book about grief, trauma, and mental illness, all of which infects Harrow's distance, unreliable second person narration. Okay. Toastposter says fourth house were the foot soldiers. Gideon realized she didn't want to go into battle after talking to the fourth house. Okay. Faden says, yeah, it's true. Corona didn't have powers. Her sister had enough for two, she said. Yeah, Ianthi was using her powers for both of them. Regards, Darren says all the necros were kind of feeble physically except Corona. Ah, but Corona didn't even have the powers. Okay. So Ianthi was like, I'm so clever. Listen to how clever I am. I didn't even have to collect keys. I knew what to do and all these things. And I'm so powerful. And I've gone into lictorhood. Um, so she, we realized, absorbed her cavalier. Did a little soul siphoning. Did a little absorption. Consumed the cavalier and the cavalier's soul so that her in her lictor form meant that she could not only do her necromancy but could fight physically like the cavalier. And her eye change would, her eye color would change to kind of like dictate whose soul was kind of controlling her body at that particular moment. But they saw how. Uh, her cavalier's fighting stance was shown, how she changed sort of like, and she was able to become a fighter, but she just wasn't strong enough to wield that sword for a long period of time, which is why Gideon was like, doink. Um, Aaron says, I did like this book's twist on the path to what essentially is lichdom. Uh, all right, let's talk about the, the twist. I'm going to go talk through the summary just to get us on the page uh, with what's going on. All right, so halfway through the book, 
Oh, wait, Lisa says, I kind of felt like Corona was so upset because the Anthony took the Cavalier when he was a nobody and didn't take Corona. Is that why she was sad? I think the eye color was because the Cavalier was not quite fully giving himself to her. Oh, right. With the con uh, completion of the last laboratory comes the realization that the keys are not only limited, but nearly all claimed. Now, the atmosphere abruptly loses all semblance of cordiality. Cord Cordiality, 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 soft D, geality. With the appearance of another body and disappearance of the seventh cavalier, protests allow us abdoma. Abdoma. Keys come to the front yet again, and this time a round of jewels and thieving uh, uh, accompanies it. Judith Deuteros, the second house, makes a power play, followed by Ianthe. Tridentarius of third. Both fail to secure new keys and the larger group fractures into three. The fifth and seventh, who are dead, missing, or incapacitated. The second, third, and eighth, who have each gone off separately to pursue keys. And then the fourth, the sixth, and the ninth, who have teamed up to follow the investigations to their conclusions. As Harrow and Palamides guard the critically ill scion of the seventh house, Gideon and fourth house descend into the facility to search for Protesilaus. Gideon's group discovers a terrifying and impossible bone construct monster, and the fourth necromancer and cavalier are slain. Following the death of the fourth house, just checking in to see how we're all feeling with this. Mm -mm -mm. I think they need a cavalier because necromancers aren't fighting and absorbing the soul and abilities of the cavaliers let them become far more capable mage and fighter in one form. Yeah, so we're essentially realizing that Gideon's going to get used and absorbed into Harrow. And she ain't going to do that willingly. Eh. Uh, act four. Following the death of force, the fourth house, Gideon and Harrow have a falling out over Dulcinea. Suspecting that Gideon may have become compromised by her feelings, Harrow forbids her from seeing the seventh and refuses to release Gideon from her service. Angry and upset, Gideon accepts an offer to take tea with eighth house, where she learns that the childhood flu that killed a generation of ninth children was in reality an act of genocide. Lost and finding more evidence against Harrow, Gideon turns to Palamides. After an all-house meeting, Harrow explains every secret that has kept her, uh, sorry, that has been kept from Gideon since birth, and the girl's bond becomes stronger than ever. Now, this was a really full-on thing. We discover that Gideon is different from everyone else who was on the ninth. A poisonous gas was basically leaked into uh like where the children were uh, as infants and all of them died except Gideon. Gideon somehow survived. Now, Vaden, I read your spoiler conversation about this and then with the ending where Gideon ends up sacrificing herself so that uh Harrow can she can be absorbed into Harrow, and I think you made such a great point. Throughout this entire book, we are told and it is re-established that Gideon is hard, if not impossible, to kill. She survived the unsurvivable. She's continuing to live. She's a very strong woman. So to then throw away her death in that particular way at the end really cheapened the whole thing. It didn't have enough weight. It didn't feel like it was necessary. It didn't. It kind of felt like, what's the point? Am I kind of um, conveying that correctly for you, Vaden? Yeah, I would say so. It it didn't feel right that she just kind of just threw herself in the spikes and then, and then died so easily. But I mean, I guess it could also be argued that she did it out of her love or respect for Harrow to be, to be strong enough to kill Cytheria. But I don't know. I didn't like it personally. I agree. It wasn't there. The payoff wasn't there personally for me. Uh, anyone else have an, uh, a thought or an opinion on uh, Gideon's demise? Demise, thrive, however you want to look at it. KB Dubs. Uh, see, I think it's just the opposite. I think maybe Gideon knew how strong she was, but she also knew that there was no way they were beating this lictor on their own. But by joining all of her incredible strength with Harrow's, who kind of is arguably the best necromancer, so if you take the best necromancer, the best, cavalier. The best cavalier, you got... Even a rookie lictor who can take on this 10,000-year-old lictor and beat her, and he did. So 
I feel it was the right decision for her. D is it right? Yes. Does it make sense? Yes. Did I care? No. <laughs> no. No. Um, we've got comments coming in. Ember and Elias says, I thought they were out of hope and anticipating a full party wipe, so she decided she didn't really have much to lose. Catch-22 says, in a world chock full of necromancy, is Gideon really even dead? K Frida says, necro book, exactly. Um, play the board again. Amanda says, it's a book about necromancy. What does dead even mean? Uh, Game Wizard says, I don't even think Gideon is dead. I fear her personality is suppressed while being a part of Harrow. And that's the biggest shame of all. <laughs> KB Dub says, oh, hell no, nah, she ain't dead. <laughs> she ain't dead. And then Kate, of course, says, da 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 is she dead? da 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 is she dead? She's not really dead. That's, I don't know. It didn't pack the punch it was supposed to, I feel. Aaron did say earlier, though, I think they, wait, I think the only thing that that will take me out is the idea that Gideon is completely gone and that despite her being a part of Harrow, the fact that Gideon is just a battery for Harrow and not a mental companion feels like a waste of a really fun character. Make it make sense. Exactly. Uh, going back to the summary. Sixth and ninth return to the keys and laboratories, but things in the Canaan house quickly collapse. Second house duels and kills the priests of the Canaan house in an attempt to send an SOS. Ianthi locates the last key and pieces together the horrible mystery of Lichterhood. Silas and Colum are killed in a battle with Ianthi, and Palamides realizes that Dulcinea Septimus is not who she claims to be. Cytheria the first, the seventh saint to serve the Lord undying. Cytheria, yep, reveals her true identity and her plan to lure the emperor home and kill him. In the following battle, Gideon gives her life for Harrow to ascend to Lictorhood and defeat Cytheria. And then in Act 5, we have Harrow, who is broken and grief-stricken, who defeats Cytheria the first. And then in the epilogue, the new Lictors, Ianthi and Harrow, are brought on to the Emperor's shuttle where he asks them to join him in the war to protect a dying empire. And they agree. Gideon's body was gone at the end, so I think she'll definitely come back next book, says Lisa. Game Wizard says her body will come back, but with no soul, the only thing that it would uh, could be would be a revenant or something like it. Hmm. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the Dulcinea twist. Dulcinea has obviously been a character in this book for some time, but then we realized that it was never Dulcinea at all. It was this Cytheria the entire time. Do you think that the 11th hour twist of it being someone that we'd never heard about makes you detached from the big bad? Or what's, I just want to hear people's take on the old switcheroo that Dulcineus was actually being possessed by an original lictor. Mew Mew Chaos says, Maud, hi, you're absolutely my favorite bean. String bean? Um, Mung bean? I, my thought on Dulcinea is, yes. I already suspect that she was probably going to be the killer just because she is the feebled one. So it's like, well, she can't do anything. But she's clearly the obvious choice to be the one to do it. If not her, her, you know, big giant uh, cavalier who we now know is just a puppet. <laughs> so He didn't have a head for half the book. <laughs> right, exactly. But I didn't obviously see the whole, oh, she wasn't. She, I did Actually, the part I didn't like wasn't so much that she was like, you know, not Dulcinea, in fact, but it was like somebody who looked similar to her. It's like, mm. really? Okay. Oh, uh, Dulcinea. What's the point of that? Not Dulcineus. Honestly, there's been, I can't remember, recall. there's so many letters in these names that are, and syllables. Yeah. But if I'm getting it wrong, I'm sorry. Almost back to the whole, there's too many characters, too many cooks. <laughs> it really does. It really does. Um, and when they split the party, it, it helped a little bit more. Like I said, the second half was a lot easier to um, follow in that particular way now that I knew more about the characters and there were less of the characters. I actually really liked the moment when they bonded with the fourth house. I really kind of, like, that's when I really cared the most. 
I really got an idea of who Isaac and Jean-Marie were. Um, and then when they died or sacrificed or I saw Jean-Marie um, wanting to go back for her cavalier, saying he might still be alive, I have to find out. Um, but then her getting killed next to Gideon in the middle of the night, I was like, oh, what? Mia's playing a lot uh, with a lot of murder mystery tropes in the last half. The Dulcinea twist is the cuckoo in the nest trope. Thank you, Michelle, for that one. And the sweet dreams message after Jean-Marie was killed was a good kind of creepy. Yeah, uh, I actually read somewhere. I'm going to read this review because I was poking around a little bit. Uh, but before I do that, Lisa, last week we had a who do you think the big bad is? Who do you think's murdering? You guessed correctly. You get to gloat. <laughs> yeah I, I, same, it was the same reason that he talked about earlier like it just she was the feeble character who just I don't know and it, it, it might have been the voice <laughs> the way she did her voice uh, kind of made her a little suspicious sounding to me mm -hmm. um, but yeah I don't know it was just a feeling and I am glad I was right <laughs> congratulations for guessing the murder mystery I can't even remember who I said last week because I haven't learnt to care. <sighs> um, Vaden says, I like the moral dilemma with Colm refusing to kill Gideon because he gave his word when she was safe when given her weapon. Yes, he stood for honour and si uh, Silas was just abusing that. And he says, all I have is my word and my sword. And fucking Silas says, no, I have your sword. Ugh, control. Awful, awful, awful. But that was a that was a really that was a beautiful part. Oh, I said seven also. Yay! I was right too. Lisa and Maud ruling the school. Ha ha ha. That's what I mean when I say gloat, Lisa. Just so you know. For next time when you're right, mmm, suck it. I'm so smart. Yeah. That's all. God. Goo. Oh, wow. You really didn't nail that. That took you three attempts, KP dubs. Yeah, that's right, Lisa. Suck it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm going to read the synopsis of Harrow the Night. Buckle up. I'm going to do it in the narrator's voice. <laughs> <laughs> Kate, well, I didn't s say that. It is the laugh, though. <laughs> that's, that's it saying that. Um, all right. She answered the Emperor's call. She arrived with her arts, her wits, and her only friend. In victory, her world has turned to ash. After rocking the cosmos with her deadly debut, Tamsin Muir continues the story of the penumbral ninth house in Haru the Ninth, a mind-twisting puzzle box of mystery, murder, magic, and mayhem. Fuck, I might just read it because of alliteration. I'm a sucker for alliteration. Kay Frito says, I have PTSD with that voice. That means I'm doing it. That means it actually does sound like the narrator. So for all those who read the book, this is what we were dealing This is what we were dealing with. Uh, this is what we were dealing with. Are you hearing Mm -mm -mm. Oh, we had alliteration. Nothing is as it seems in the halls of the Emperor, and the fate of the galaxy rests on one woman's shoulders. Harrowhark Nonagesimus, the last necromancer of the Ninth House, has been drafted by her Emperor to fight an unwinnable war. Side by side with a detested rival, Harrow must perfect her skill. They don't indicate that if that's Ianthe or if that's technically Gideon. Hmm. Harrow must perfect her skills and become an angel of undeath. But her health is failing, her sword makes her nauseous, and even her mind is threatening to betray her. Sealed in the gothic gloom of the Emperor's Mithraeum, with three unfriendly teachers, hunted by the mad ghost of a murdered planet, Harry must confront two unwelcome questions. Is somebody trying to kill her? And if they succeed, would the universe be better off? This is the most mentally privileged thing I'm ever going to say. I already know that I'm going to struggle to relate to someone who wants to die. That is an incredibly loaded sentence to say. I understand there is a lot to unpack with that. 
and I am in no way bettering myself from people that feel that. In fact, that actually might be helpful for me to understand sort of like the differences and layered feelings of depression and depressive tendencies. I have experienced depressive tendencies. Oh boy. Um, but that'll be really interesting. Interesting. Uh, but everyone's really stuck on the one part where it says hunted by the mad ghost of a murdered planet. Like, what is that? What does that mean? Who murdered the planet? How does a planet have a ghost? What is that about? Did the planet blow up? I thought the planet was still intact. Was the ghost hiding inside the planet? How do you kill a planet? Is that a comet? See, I'm going back into only what I know about these things. Is it the Desta? That's no moon. Ask Ego. Mm, it could be those 10 billion dead from the plot twist. 10 billion? Oddball, what's that plot twist? Refresh my memory. At that long chapter at the end where she wanted to avenge the 10 billion dead to kill the emperor. Wow, I glossed over that, didn't I? That is her motivation. Sometimes all you need with murder is the motivation. How does a planet have... Coraline says, if I, I wonder if listening to the audiobook instead of reading it affects how much people liked the book. A good narrator can make or break. Coraline's 100%. I actually, the last book that we did, I ended up having to buy the book because I could not stick the narrator. Um, it just was the way it just, I couldn't absorb what she was saying. But then once I read the first half of the book and was able to kind of depict all the characters and do all the... Great. Um... <laughs> so, so what happened is I just touched my ear and these new Alienware 928 headsets, you can't see them, but there's actually music playing capability on here. So if I swipe up, it turns the volume up. If I swipe down, it turns the volume down. And if I tap it or move it forward, it will actually start music. I was scratching my ear. Um, but for those wondering, I already sh shut it off. I believe the band was the Temples. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, Star Pilot 6 said, first try. Oh, did that come up? That should come up. Why didn't it come up? First try. Oh. Uh, I will say that the, in the sequel, there are at least a fewer main characters that you need to keep track of. I like that. Star Pilot 6 is trying to sell us the sequel. Who else wants to try? Who's, who's watched it, read it? My God. Who's read the sequel who wants to try and sell it to us? Bots up. Yeah, bots up. Bots up. Mm. Mm. Bottoms up. Okay, says so the sequel is almost like this series Inheritance or Midsommar, an allegory of grief. Oh, wow, 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 wow. What is grief if not love persevering? <laughs> Beautiful stuff. Um, is there anything else in the third act, the breakdown, the ending that we want to go over at all? Because we still have 30 minutes to talk about this book. Great. Vaden says the person in the locked tomb. Uh, Star Pilot 6 says, uh, I could also say something that would immediately turn me off reading the sequel if I hadn't already brought it, bought it before I found out. Go on, Star Pilot 6, roll the dice, hit us with it. <laughs> I'm interested to know that. All right, Person in the Locked Tomb. Essentially on the ninth house on the planet, um, they were, they're keeping something locked in a tomb. There is a ceremony where they roll the boulder across the tomb's entrance so no one could get in. Harrow, being a 10-year-old who's found out that she's absorbed the souls of 200 babies, children, infants, um, 
who I understand the grief and the pressure that's surmounted where she, I actually think that Haro is an interesting character. She didn't ask for that when she was born. It was something that was done to her. But now because she has the chosen one trope, it is up to her knowing that 200 children, babies, um, infants were sacrificed to strengthen her because her sole job is to replenish to save the planet it is dying something's happening with the ninth um and it's up to her to save it all so she's got that pressure just building and so she realized that she was a lot stronger than everyone else uh is that and so wanted to learn more about the tomb so it took her what a week or so of like testing all of the not charms the traps the things that are trying to keep her out. She was able to get through it all and then found out that in the tomb, it is encasing a young girl who's kind of like what frozen wards. Thank you, Lisa. That's the word I was looking for. This girl is frozen. It's preserved. Um, Aaron says the all powerful emperor who ends up being described as just a middle-aged looking grandfather figure and he can't do everything to uh, like help remove a soul from another without destroying both souls. Um, Aaron also says she called herself a war crime. This is Harrow. Harrow called herself, that was like whew, full on. She calls herself a war crime and killed the future of her house to preserve her house. KB Dub says, well, Harrow's parents used the energy of the 200 deaths to conceive a powerful necromancer child. I don't know that their souls are in Harrow. Thank you. And KP Dubs also goes on to say the frozen girl's name is Elsa. I'm calling it right now. Who wants to describe what the hell's going on with this tomb and the preserved young girl? What's that all about? Anyone? I have a theory. Go on, Aaron. Obviously, I don't know anything, but my theory is it could have been like the first lictor. In the body of a young Just girl. Yeah, like chained up, sealed away, and that's like the big bad evil that the Emperor was trying to fight against and still probably couldn't because why Why chain a body into a tomb? <laughs> we got a little case of and, the Benjamin Buttons, you think? Yeah. <laughs> Not so young, probably one of the oldest entities on the planet, but is being sustained yeah. by life. Yeah, it's just sleeping in, in hibernation kind of thing. Mm. Uh, Michelle, you've got a theory as well. Yeah, so she's buried with a sword and armor, right? So I think my thought was that she might be the um, emperor's cavalier, and um, because he's a lictor too, right, or something like that. And you, it seems like in order for that to be successful, it works better if the cavalier is willing to make that sacrifice. She to... wasn't willing. And she wasn't willing. I do love how many women cavaliers there were throughout this book. That was mm -hmm. cool. I like that. Uh, KP Dub says she's described as the um, described as that which can destroy the emperor. Uh, Aaron says, you know, what? that's probably a better theory. It's the body of the cavalier and the uh, of the emperor, and he has her soul in him. So she's just trying to get her soul back. Uh, Vaden says her parents, Harrow's parents literally kill themselves because Harrow opened this tomb and saw what was within. Was Harrow then, because she she walked, she walked in to see them all hanging and then decided to animate her, the, the, her parents' corpses for a bit longer? Is that what went down? What happened was um, the, the parents basically committed suicide and they, they asked her if she wanted to basically do it with them. And she's like, no, I'm going to stay alive. Mm, got it. Uh, also wanting to just provide trigger warnings, talking about suicide um, and talking about hanging, all that kind of stuff. Definitely trigger warnings for all of that. Uh, if this isn't your cup of tea, feel free to leave. Totally understandable for that. And we will try to be very, very sensitive about these topics. Um, I think when you have a necromancer book talking about death, even like reanimated corpses, it is, it is definitely um, a big topic. But I just want to just want to clear it, be sensitive about it. Um, Oddball, you have a theory that she's more tied to Gideon. 
Uh, what's her name? Cytheria. Cytheria even said it. You're not the first Gideon I've met. But, that and she was surprised that she was a redhead. Mm. And she's like, stop saying vague shit to me because it's really frustrating. And I'm like, thank you. Please make this make sense. Um, I, I think that was supposed to be a bit of a throwaway line, but for that one, I went, Psh. aha, there is another Gideon in the past. Something happened. Is Gideon reborn? Is it the same one? The hair color was a very interesting note. Well done for that one, oddball. Loving it. Uh, and then Aaron says the note that she found mentioned a Gideon as well. This mystical note that's sort of been ripped up. What do we think about the note? Note. No. What are our Gideon theories? Vaden says it makes me wonder if they've got reincarnation in this universe. Jimmy says it's always a little throwaway that can get ya. You know, I was just thinking, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, about... Uh, <clears throat> The theory, right? Because yeah. you were saying before that there is a, a a frozen girl in a tomb. She's got the various items, you know, like to fight. So it would make sense, like that, if um, Harrow, I think it's the person's name, Harrow, could somehow channel Gideon into that frozen little girl, and then somehow control her, and then have her fight the emperor. I think that would be pretty sweet. That's just an in the, an idea of mine because okay. hey we're all here know, for theories yeah uh, who knows what will happen but there's definitely a chance because um m much like in the show dragon ball z when you hurt yourself you get stronger when you heal you know like yes you also you go know, into the no here but i'm just saying that's just how it is you, you know? also go into the hyperbolic time chamber to train of course we're, there are many ways but yeah. i'm just saying e either way in the rules of this thing and their necromancers so it would make sense that they could somehow channel or resurrect in some way you know mm. uh aaron makes a great point i think caro even talked about separating the souls but they have been too conjoined if they separate they die basically they are bonded too closely vaden says channeling gideon into another body is a cool idea however harrow wants to help the emperor do we think the Emperor is good or the Emperor is bad? As far as I go with falling into tropes, usually a tyrannical leader is not good. Now, that's going to be the twist because Cytheria is like, ha, 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 I want to kill the Emperor. And you're like, no, we have to kill you. But what if she was right all along? Dude, good? <laughs> <laughs> emperor good this is great toaster poster says is the girl in the tomb the real empress and the current emperor is a fake oh i love these theories uh kate out of any and all of the theories that we've said pr try to be as vague as possible but have we gotten close to any of them kate good i can't hear I saw you on mute. I just couldn't hear you talk. <laughs> Kate just gave a non-committal noise. Oh, really? I just went, ugh. Oh, okay. I miss that. Uh, I like that you commented, though. Theory good? <laughs> I've got to get book good shirts made up. Uh, Aaron says, right now, don't get the tyrannical emperor vibe yet, but certainly a failing one who is doing what he can to keep the lights on, so to speak. Michelle says, we also have the Emperor's word on what can and cannot be done. I think that dude is holding stuff back to control people, especially Harrow. Mug good, shirt good. I like it. <laughs> I also like that we just like decided that good is gud. <laughs> G-U-D. Good. 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 I love book good. Hey, welcome to book club. Book good. <laughs> My favorite. Uh, Emperor is definitely holding back. Get good. Got to get good over here. Uh, reading the blurb of Harrow the Ninth. Are we more inclined, less inclined to read the book? And Star Pilot. 
don't think I forgot that you were going to tell us a little something something that you found out before the book. I'm going to refer to the comment where you said, though I could also say something that would immediately turn me off reading the sequel if I hadn't already bought it before I found out. How many of us have got the book? I bought it. Book good. Book bought. Book. Book bought. <laughs> Book board. Lisa says they did. Uh, said that there were some second person perspectives. Oh, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> I realized I was turning into a chicken. <laughs> the chicken. Play the boards, got it. Oddball doesn't have it yet. Vaden's got the audio book. Monkey Bar says I arrived in time to meet Chicken Maud. She's a hoot. She's a bit clucky. <laughs> chicken Maud's pretty entertaining. Hashtag chicken what it's, it's you know what it is I'll be real because I can see myself on video I'm looking at me I don't look at the camera I look at just to see if I got shit on my face um book book it's just great cheeks are cool book. <laughs> that's all KP Dubs is gonna get it and read it negative Ghost Rider says catch twenty two K Fredo just says hashtag chicken mod book uh digital local library love that one Jimmy. Uh, Star Pilot says, I'm really not a fan of second person perspectives. So second person is saying you the whole time. First person, I did this, I did that. Second person is you do this, you do that. Third person is they did this, they did that. We've only really delved into a little bit of second person and that was at the start. You good? <laughs> you good? Are you good? Um... And that was for uh, the night circus. Um, it was the only time we we danced a little in sec second person, but I felt it was really effectively used there because it would go between um, second and third person. Star Pilot 6 says, tell me there's a group of necromancers on a different planet. Like, I'm like, cool, I'd buy that, but tell me that I'm doing something and I'm like, no, stop, I'm lying. Um, I've actually had an example of that in a book, in a nonfiction book. Um I read a lot of self-improvement. I haven't for a while, though, because I've been doing too many book clubs. But there's one called The Four... The Four... Oh, it's so well known. Not The Four Body Problems. Four Agreements. Four Agreements. Who was that? Kate? Lise? Kate? Who said that? It's your local bookseller... Thank you. Thank you. The fat's eerie that you sound similar, though. Maybe because there's so few women that talk to me. Um, the four agreements, uh, a couple of times in the four agreements, it's like, let me guess. You know, it wasn't even let me guess. It was like, you struggle with this. You struggle with that. And I'm like, no, I don't. And you will do this. And you often find yourself thinking these thoughts. And I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh. Please don't tell me how I think. Please don't tell me what you think I am. And I, I really, the people are so unique and beautiful and you can't blanket what anyone thinks or does. And I don't like that. Raven Rune Queen gave us a follow four minutes ago. Welcome to Book Chat. Book good. We've read Gideon the Ninth. We've been talking all about Tamsin Muir's lesbian necromancers in space book. There are characters. Visual reference is helpful. Uh, Lisa says, I wish I was a bookseller. And KP Dub says, it's retail, so be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, where are the other lictors? Asks Toaster Poster. Only Cytheria and the Emperor survived 10,000 years ago. That's a long time. I guess we are in space. Space. All right. How do we feel about the book? Next, excuse me, next month, uh, we're going to be reading House by the, House by, I'm just grumbling. I think I get it from my dog. Cerulean C. House in the, house in the, not by the, this whole time. House in the Cerulean C. Am I saying Cerulean right or is it's not a hard C? Cerulean. Um, let's get the blurb on that one. A magical island, a dangerous task, a burning secret. Linus Baker leads a quiet, solitary life 
At 40, he lives in a tiny house um, with a devious cat and his old records. As a caseworker at the department in change, or, uh, sorry, charge of mag magical youth, he spends his days overseeing the well-being of children in government-sanctioned orphanages. That's what we're going to be reading next. Book good. Uh, it's got a 4.45 out of 5, and there have been 315,000 ratings. Oh, Terry, we do not need that gif in the Discord. Lich, lich. I'm saying it like I'm German, not lick. I say lich, lich. Not lish, lich, lich. Shit, is this how we're going to be spending our next 15 minutes? How you say L-I-C-H? Lich. 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 I mean, if you want to be German about it, sure. I want to be German about it. I do. Rick von Lichtenstein. <laughs> Lich. Rhymes with bitch. Cash for two says, I'm gonna go cry now. Lich. Lichtenstein. That's it. Oh, I keep swearing. Okay, Fredo, you call me out on all of them. Cash two says, I might actually read this one because it's about a single 40 year old guy, so I might be able to relate. Lick. Lich. 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 If you want to be German about it. <laughs> if you could choose to be German about it, why would you not? Why would you not? Wechner. Wechner the Lich. <laughs> Shit. Wechner the Lich. 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 Bitching about Lich. Um, just chatting over here. Wechner. Back and up. People let me have a show. You know, it just boggles the mind from time to time. Um, join us over in the Discord. Uh, reading is locked down. Help support Geek Bomb. Five bucks a month gets your book club access, helps keep the company operating. And we just hit 10 freaking years. What? Five gift subs to the community, KP Dubs? Uh, that. Kachuk, Toblescones, Craft Brew Boy, Old Dirty Bastard. Uh, I feel like there should be one more there. They all just got gifted a sub. Thanks to KP Dubs. Alvac got one. Yay, that's cool. The Lich licked the lichen. Oh, thanks, Toast Poster. Um, do we want to... Are we okay to end 10 minutes early? Gosh, it's game changer when I don't love a book, huh? I'm like, we could wrap, we could wrap it up. Little weird guy says, 10 years. I know, 10 years. Star Pilot 6 says, by the way, for anyone in Canada or the US who did love Gideon and has an interest in such things, Goodreads is currently running a giveaway for a signed copy. Love that. Can we find out the link for that and post it in that um, um, reading section in the Discord? That would be cool. Craft Brew Boy says, thanks for the gift sub to KP Dubs. Oh, love this community. Love this community. Oh, it bears repeating. I've said it a couple of times, but I will say it again. Anything that the Patreon makes, I do not put it in my pocket. It goes directly back into the company. It means that I can pay um, contributors to help run the site, to help make content, to write articles, to do social media, to keep making cool, nerdy, geeky content. So appreciate everyone for that one. Geek Bomb is literally done out of the goodness of my heart. I don't get paid for it. Is that smart? It's not a good business model, but it's worth it for me. Um, KP Dub says, hey, speaking of, isn't there a cool thing on Patreon right now? Well done, KP Dubs. Yes, there is. Because we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary, if you sign up now to any tier, wait, I've got to get the specifics of it. But if you stay, for three months, we send you a limited edition exclusive gift, which has the ten year, the new 10 year anniversary logo on there, which was done by our brand new graphics designer that we just hired. Exclusive. 
Thank you. Yeah, Jimmy, we've got to get that down. Exclusive. 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 It's an exclusive gift, likely brought to you by Seb. That's how that works around here, around this part of town called Geek Bomb. Uh, let's raid. What are we feeling? Do we want to watch some Fall Guys? Do we want to watch some D and D? What are we feeling? What are we feeling? We could just peace out. I've got a salad for dinner. I'm thinking Dungeon Run 2 actually, Vaden. I'm feeling Dungeon Run 2. There we go. Now, if I could just ask for another three minutes of your time so that we can go raid and drop some bombs and make people feel good in the chat for all of 90 seconds, let's do it. Thank you for doing Giddy in the Ninth. This was on our TBR for a while, and the biggest point of this book club is to get through the books that we need a little bit of assistance with. Let us read. Good night, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to be doing a really, really fun community tele... Celebrating 10 year stream. Uh, I'm going to be watching old Geek Bomb videos and then we're going to be doing a community game session. <gasps> Chef Squad! I'm going to yell at everyone in the kitchen and I'm giving away a brand new Alienware laptop if that ain't cool enough for you. If you haven't followed, please do. We're going live tomorrow at 4 p.m. PT. I'll see you then. Let's raid Dungeon Run. Bye! Lish.